Hi everyone, I'm Michaela Muldoon with the Art Gallery of Windsor and I'm here with Olivier Maurice from Moment Factory, a digital media company based in Montreal. Would you like to talk about uh, your position a little bit please, Olivier? Yeah, I'm an interactive producer from the interactive at Moment Factory. Uh, it's been, I think, uh, four and a half years since I've been working uh, at Moment, so uh, I'm happy to be there today. Excellent. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. So the main topic that we're going to be discussing today is interactive digital projects, because that's Mo Moment Factory's specialty. Mm -hmm. So we'll start off with the first question centered around Moment Factory itself. What defines an interactive project at Moment Factory? Yeah, uh, unlike a pre-rendered project, it is important to know that an inter interactive project puts the user as the art of the experience. So in order to, for them to feel impacted by the work they see in front of them, we need to think about content that is not static in time, but reacts directly to what is happening. So we use real-time creation tools that allows us to go beyond the framework of just having a video with a beginning and an end. In this way, we can create several possibilities in a scenario that can be triggered by the interaction of a user. So that's really the important thing to, to remember of these interactive processes. The, the, the user is the hero of, of, uh, of the story and he needs to interact with it to discover, uh, his, to discover his secrets. Excellent. Thank you for your insight on that. So when you start planning one of these interactive projects, where exactly do you start? Like step one, I guess. Yeah, there's so much ground to cover when we start a project because interactive project does not mean it's only content. There's also the narrative and there's a big part, the code behind it. But where do we start? Uh, it's important to know that in an interactive project, it's not just made by one person, it's made by a team. So we need to sit down together at first and listen to each other realities because there's so many kind of people who work in this, in this interactive process. Uh, could be designers, could be developers, could be concept writer. So we need to find the right balance uh, to move forward as a team and to come up with prototypes and prototypes and reiterate from those. We usually start the project uh, by a WBS session. Uh, this is a work breakdown structure. So in short, we try to describe all the deliverables of our projects in as much detail as we can. So every task is described in this WBS and it should be assigned to one single person. So at the end, it's easier to say, okay, we're going to start by this and this and this. You're going to be attributed uh, to this person so we can have a better track of what's going on. And then again, in order to see, okay, what are we going to start with? We prioritize again as a team and we start to uh, figure how to make it happen. And that's where the agile approach, uh, agile approach comes in as well in this kind of uh, way to do projects. Okay, yes. Yeah. So agile project management, that's kind of um, adapting as you go through, like while you're making the project and making the changes based on any feedback or any problems that you might encounter, right? Yeah, exactly. Because um, it's good to know that there's like two main schools of management in projects. There's like the waterfall management and the agile one. So let's say in a waterfall process, uh, it can work in a very uh, in its proper context. It can work very well. So let's say we have a, a VFX project or we build a movie. So we usually start by just creating the mood board, the artistic direction. We consider the scenario. We animate it to get an, an idea of the work to come. We design the assets, the textures. We model uh, if needed. We start to compose the scene. We add the post process. We make the renders. We add some, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the problem with that is even if there's a small change at the end of the, the production, it costs less in terms of production and in time. So do we want to remove this element? Do we want to reduce the speed of the bird that's uh, passing through the screen? Do we want to reduce the size? Even if we do one single change, we have to go through all the steps of compositing, re-rendering, and the days are starting to count. So. It's not necessarily the best process when we want to implicate the user in the art of this experience. So in real time, when we, we use, let's say, uh, video games uh, engine like Unity or Unreal or other software like this, you can modify everything you want and the result is in a few seconds. So that really helps to iterate and iterate and to see uh, the process that we can achieve. So 
In agile management, when we start a project, we quickly try to test what we don't know and which may lead to the problem. So the motto for management is fall often, but fail fast. So, so the goal is we can fail quite, quite some times, but at least we fail fast in a week. We can say, okay, that's a problem. We're going to iterate um, about it. And it allows us to find solutions to important problems. We don't have the luxury of waiting for. So we don't start by what we know, but we start by what we don't know. So we think about the software structures before coding. We think about the user experience before we design the visuals. This way, we think about the different possibilities, the different edges and list possible solutions. And we prototype and we prototype to validate our hypothesis. Because it's, it's important to know that in agile management, we work in sprint that we call. It's usually based on a three weeks uh, plan. So before we start the work, we establish the objectives as a team, again, with the work that we did on the WBS uh, structure. And it tr we try to stay focused on these objectives. We don't add anything new. And at the end of these three weeks, we don't not only talk about what we did, but we show a prototype, a functional one, and we test it with people. We test it with users because their feedback are really important to move for forward in an agile way because we test with the targeted audience at first and then, okay, this doesn't work. At least I can change the score mechanic and adapt and adapt and not change only at the end when it's already too late. So basically, and that's uh, agile management that we try to, to have at moments. Sounds like the smarter way to work. Yeah, basically we gain time at the end, so. That's, yeah, it sounds like something that could be a, applicable across industries actually. So um, yeah, that's, that's great that you guys do that. Um, and we're also wondering here at the art gallery with any type of digital immersive experience, what kinds of touch points do you consider to enhance the visitor experience for the project? Yeah, the, the beauty of having, let's say, real-time content or interactive content is that you can communicate multiple software systems together. So we don't have to, to think only about projections. Let's say we won't focus only on video and sound. We could add lights to it. We could add physical touch points, connected objects, let's say, at some device. You can use your phone to uh, trigger an effect on the wall. So the user feel a bit more immerse in that environment. So we can just think, just an example, we have a screen in an interactive context. So we bring the concept of a state machine. So each state is triggered by an action of the user. So let's say we, we have a creature in front of us. Uh, no one is close to the screen. So the creature is not waving at us to come closer. We can hear a small sound, just uh, entice people to come closer to the screen. As the user approaches, it's detected by, let's say, a present sensor, and the creature changes attitude, and it starts to anim animate in a different way. So it just detects someone close to him, and okay, I'm not going to wave anymore because the, the, the person is close to me. I'm going to do a little, maybe a little dance. And the user with his hand could touch the creature on the, on the screen, and it starts to giggle to, to, to do something. And the more we touch it, the more it has fun until it changed completely, a new visual appears, there's a new powwow uh, kind of sound, and uh, that's a climax. And this is the power of the interactive process. It's to inside the visitor to explore what is presented to him, and not only to be like in a contemplative air. So we don't just take a step back and look at it, but we are immersed in it, and we try to discover his, uh, every secret. Very good. Thank you for sharing. So in, in terms of audiences for these projects, uh, like how, how should an organization that's partnering with Moment Factory to create a digital experience like the ones that you were just describing, um, how would they go about identifying and targeting their audiences for the projects? The audiences are very determined by what kind of client we are because it's very varied in project. Generally, uh, we hope that the experience will be quite interesting for young children and older people. It has to be universally understood the way that we present the technology. It doesn't need to be just fit for one type of person. It needs to be well understood for everyone. So 
I, we can make the metaphor, let's say, with Disney movies, often on two levels. So the first level is it's quite simple, can be understood by everyone. So let's say we, we have, you have a screen, again, the creator comes back, and we can jump jump around just on, on, the, on the same place, and while I jump, the creature jumps in front of me. So the, the child is having fun, just jumping, jumping, the creatures respond to it. But let's say an adult can find Okay, the higher I jump, the higher the creature jump, or it starts to do something else. It starts to to call another creature just close to him. It just to find this little behaviors and this installation and discover its secrets. So that's what we try to aim when we have, let's say, a, a different audience. It's to have that this first level of interaction that it's fun, it's beautiful, but to have like this meaning, this message behind it to uh, to be more confident for an older audience. Okay, so yeah, you try to make it as universal as possible. And yeah, of course, like you said, it does depend on who uh, the person, the client that you're working with, their target audience too. So do you have any ways of like kind of finding out based on your own research or like your own statistics on how your projects go? uh, What kind of audiences respond best to certain features and like based on that you can make recommendations to the client you're working with anything like that yeah because we we try to do like we have a ux lab at the moment factory and ux is focused really on the user and we try to have like maybe standard of experiences and what kind of personas will do uh we do the experience so let's say uh, for the uh, windsor experience uh we want to attract the, the locals and maybe not only the people are used to the art. So we know that our experience shouldn't focus really uh, for people who already know the artist, what's the meaning of everything, but we try to approach in a different way to, to uh, make it discover this new type of art. Maybe they just uh, watch uh, some uh, movie actions or they don't go to theaters and they don't accustomed to this uh, uh, narrative of, uh, of the artist. So our first approach is not to go as deep as someone who is uh, well knowledge of what's happening with, uh, let's say, uh, Norman Morisot, but who we try to approach in a fun way, in a fun way, uh, a small, um, let's say, interactive um, approach that you can just play with a game. And then we you discover information about the artist in a visual approach, but also like a, in a fun narrative approach as well. It's not just to be informative, but we need really to fit with the, the, the right mind of the people. So it's basically, we can go from all type of audiences, but we need to think about, okay, where are we delivering this project? Where is it with what kind of people? And we adapt our type of, con- of concept or text or visuals to entice really the people who doesn't know a thing about art to maybe just understand something. So. Okay, so reaching out to new audiences through these projects then. Yeah, exactly. Nice. So how do you know if a digital project is right for Moment Factory to take on? What makes you decide, yes, we want to partner with this this company, this organization? Basically, Moment Factory, this is our company name, and we we do it in public just under it. So a project that works towards the goal of bringing people together in the public space then that's a good project for Moment Factory. We're really trying to get people to interact with each other, each other outside in the outside world. So that's a we do, we do it in public form of, of that. And also if it's innovative in a way, it could be just in the way that we want to transmit the message or the technology that we use, it's even a plus. But at first, we just want to bring people together and that's a good fit for any projects with Moment. That's awesome. So when you collaborate with another institution on a project like that, uh, what does it typically look like? Let's say when we have a client who is on board with our process and everything and works towards like the agile management way, it's nice to include them not only at milestone. So let's say we're not just going to present the 25%, 50%, 75%, and that's it, the project is delivered. But it needs also to be part of the creation process. We share progress with them. We ask for his opinion. When we do user tests, let's say we share the feedback and we take, uh, we say why we take this path rather than the other. So in this way, we have like a, maybe a dis- uh, dissatisfaction at the end because in a waterfall process, 
me back a certain moment, hey, that's too late. That's what you're gonna have, you're gonna get because in a way it's too late. And maybe trying to having like this type of uh, sharing the process, sharing our errors, sharing what we learn with the clients uh, gives us to be more involved in our process. It's, it's going to be part of the solution. That's really important in this uh, agile process. The, sal- the, the, the client is not only someone who approves, but it's is part of the solution of uh, what we're trying to achieve. So let's say with the, the uh, Windsor Art Gallery, uh, we have the client, we see uh, her, uh, every three weeks, we share progress. Okay, where are you at? What, what do you think about that? This is our first gameplay, we just tested. It doesn't work, but is our next ID to, to move it forward? So in that way, she understands really our reality of developing an application. And then at the end, she it's going to be it's going to be a, a good one for her because she's going to know everything that happened. And that's going to be the right direction because we tested it, we share with Twitter. So there's no big surprises at the end. So. That's good. Yeah. Constant communication is definitely important with launching a project like this. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, once the project's out there in the world, it's on the go, it's been launched, uh, people are interacting with it. What are some of the uh, key performance indicators that you look for to to show how the project is doing, whether or not it's doing well? Yeah, um, in some projects, especially interactive one, we try to implement, like, let's say, user data analytics on those because it's really subjective. At some point, you say, okay, it's working, but do I really know how it's working well or not? So. Um, Let's say for this uh, discovery map that we're building for the uh, Spencer Gallery, which we're doing a website. So we are able to, let's see how many people uh, try the game, how many people completed the, the whole experience, how many people get to the museum after completed the experience. So that kind of data, it's really interesting to know because it helps not only to say, okay, uh, people like it, but also, uh, it gathered people to my museum and, and the, the different incomes that can follow uh, from it. So we really try to add this little data that can be super interesting, not only for us, but also as a client perspective. You see, okay, the money that I put in doing like this creative way of uh, attracting new new people, that is, does it work or not? So uh, we don't do it in every project because there's like a, a software part of it that we need to track, okay. It, what kind of attraction that we can start to track people. But let's in a website, it's uh, very uh, fluent with Google Analytics and, and everything, and just to put some um, endpoint on uh, specific action that we want to track. So. Okay, and also, are there any um, live in-person observational components? Like, do you ever observe the community or the audience interacting with the project in person? And is there anything that you look for there as you're kind of people watching yeah because um i don't know if you know but we have luminance at moment factories uh the enchanted forest we have about i think 13 in the world and the goal when we deliver this kind of project is not okay integration is done i can go on and that's it and uh, good luck for the next years it's we we try to have soft launch to our projects so let's say just before the integration and and before it's opening to a large public we test it with locals and just to see how they react. Um, is the message clear? What can we improve? So we, we maybe have a couple of days before the official launch to uh, maybe modify and iterate of some minor aspects that can really enhance the, the, the experience at the end. Especially in terms of having an interactive project, we need the feedback of users. Yeah, we do UX test at that moment, but Sometimes it's not necessarily the, the, the same audience that's going to play with, with, let's say, the app or play with the experience. So it's really important to, okay, we're going to just deploy it for a couple of days and just see how people play with it in a real uh, context. And after that, we might give us a couple of weeks or days just to tweak some, some key mechanics, not necessarily to reinvent everything, but just to tweak it enough so this little uh, flaws that were not well understood are better. And we have a, a second launch after it, which is the official one. And uh, at least we have one proper session with feedback of users just before. And so that's really important in the way we build our projects. 
Okay, yes. And actually, um, branching off from there, if things are not going well, or even if they are in terms of engaging people, uh, what are some, some strategies that you use or that you um, encourage the organization you're working with to use to boost audience engagement? After project is launched, it's not necessarily, okay, the team is out and uh, we don't uh, even think about this project anymore. It's really like a, a phase process. So usually with an inter interactive project, when we launch it, okay, it's like the first test with real users, but it doesn't mean that the experience after it is going to be, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be finished. We need to improve it. And as first people, we try to complexify the concept. We want to have like all these villages, these possible uh, scenarios and everything. We need to have the same person, same person, same person way to do the interaction to be uh, to entice like to a, a larger crowd and after we try maybe for a couple of weeks couple of months we can arrive with a new let's say a, a new update to it for per se for the winter art gallery it's going to be everything's going to be on the phone as first we want to try okay, do they understand what's the meaning of the message that we want to transmit do they understand the core mechanic of the games but as we go uh, more and more we might add physical touch point with the experience. So let's say instead of just having a phone, maybe they can look at the projection, they can hear sounds in the city and the, the phone is starting to be the controller, uh, let's say the, the controller of these uh, activations. So we really think in not only in the process that we do the development in an interactive way, but also of the deployment of the projects in the interactive process as well. So we just make sure that's it. Well understood, and then we move forward with uh, maybe a deeper interactive uh, uh, touch point to make the physical world and virtual one. So I hope it answers uh, the question in a way. But uh... yeah, I think you know. I know it is a, a tough question. It's very situational. Thank you so much for your time and for answering the questions. You're welcome.